introduction, we'll walk through that and we'll kind of lay the framework for which um, God has uh, put these things together, what he actually commands parents to do um, and uh, who's responsible and then uh, what those kind of responsibilities look like in a vocation. And then we'll kind of continue off of that, building upon it. Um, but let's open up with the word of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have called us to be within the family, both within the family that you've given us by blood and by birth, and also the new birth and the family that is your holy church. But bless us always to serve not ourselves, but sacrificially, just as you serve us, that we may care for one another, family, church, those who are our neighbors, most closest neighbors, in both word and deed, in love and action, and help us always to find forgiveness in you and not to seek perfection in all things, for you are perfect, but to just do the right thing, and that you have called us and justified us all in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So Timothy writes, uh, well, Paul writes to Timothy, rather, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and for such people, uh, and for such people turn away. And so you think, you know, on this list of grievous sins of things that are going to happen in these last perilous days, and if you want to know if we're living in those last perilous days, we are. They have begun ever since our Lord uh, ascended to the right hand of God the Father, that these are those gray and latter days that we live in until our Lord returns. But uh, you could see that in this list of grievous sins that will happen on earth until that last day, um, things that are condemned as evil, one of them that stands out is disobedient to parents. And um, if you look at the Greek word, I mean, just the definition of disobedient, um, uh, apithes, right? It, its meaning is really unbelieving or someone who is uh, not to be persuaded. Um, so you think those who are um, either unbelieving in their parents, and we'll talk about what that means because parents fulfill a role, they act in the stead of God. Um, and then um, someone who is not persuaded, as in they don't care much for whatever their parents may have said. Um, so it ranks within these lists of, of heinous uh, attitudes and actions. And you think, and this is probably contrary to how, I mean, you could see this play out in our culture now in terms of disobedience to parents and what the outcome of that is. And we'll talk about um, maybe a little bit in this, but uh, in the next session, we'll talk about parenting strategies um, that you can look at, especially if you, if you have any kind of uh, psychology books or anything like that. There are lots of different ways of parenting. Um, but, you know, Parents learn about who God is from their parents in both actions and in teaching. Um, in Proverbs 3, Proverbs was a good job of, of kind of building a foundation, a house upon godly wisdom. And it says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. And the righteous are those who are obedient to his word and that are found in him. And so we, we got a culture here that promotes the idea of egalitarian parenting. And if we want to define that, it would be those who would believe the principle that people are equal in all things, um, that there is no distinction between people at all. And that's really not true. Um, and we could say uh, in parenting itself, it's where no one sort of exercises an authority or that they would believe in this relationship, parents and children are both 
uh, in the same equal position. Sometimes it's called friendship parenting, um, which you know is very popular. There's lots of articles about it. I mean, you can Google all sorts of things about it. Um, and it depends on what you mean by that in terms of friendship parenting. But uh, you, the idea that parents and children stand equal within the family is something that's very much promoted within culture. And it creates an atmosphere in which um, there is no authority or there is a sort of uh, degrading of the authority of parents. If parents don't, if children do not respect their parents, then more than likely they won't respect God and they'll have a warped understanding or view of that. So scripture views parenting as a vocation ordained by God. And we'll talk about the word vocation that parents, and here's the key, uh, act as God for their children. Um, and that shouldn't be a shocking thing. We'll break down what that is. That's actually how God does a lot of things. He works through means. And so uh, sometimes Luther talks about this in terms of a mask. You know, you act as a mask of God for someone else. Um, and we'll roll, roll over through that. But something to think about that's really countercultural when you talk about children is children are a gift from the Lord. And a gift, and people, I think most people would say amen to that for the most part. But what I mean is, in a very extreme sense, that when children are born, that it's never a sin. And that might be a little contrary to how people view the world, too. I mean, and I, I'll I'll say this, and again, I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but um, often what you find is, especially in younger couples, will say, well, I'm going to wait until the right moment to have children. Um, or I'm going to wait until this becomes this way. Or, I mean, you see a large number of people who are not actually having children at all. And they would say, well, I don't want to bring children into a world that is X. You know, the world's bad and I don't want to have children in here. But scripture never frames a time limit or there's never some kind of qualification for children being a blessing. It is always. So every time the womb is opened and, and uh, a woman bears a child, then it's always a blessing from the Lord. You can see that in the Psalms, particularly in Psalm 127, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, uh, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. And there are other Psalms that talk about this as well. Children are like the olive shoots. They come out, they, they go all over the place. And that is a great blessing um, as they gather around in the family. So um, they're never a curse or a burden. And maybe burden is probably the way we like to frame a lot of things in culture for children as well. So uh, I'll wait for this time. And that would that would say, well, children are a burden that I have to be in this sort of mindset or in this financial situation or whatever the case may be. Um, and again, I'm not I'm not advocating something that's reckless, you know, but um, there is a fundamental difference in the way our society thinks about children and the way scripture does that whenever they come, when when children are, when the Lord blesses you with the gift of children, it's not so much you get to decide, but the Lord decides. He opens and closes wombs. Um, and uh, that is actually very different than, you know, maybe the modern understanding of family planning that we have. Um, so, uh, they're a gift that that is to be cherished and cared for. And, you know, next to God himself, God gives parents the highest honor uh, because God sees being a father or mother as the highest position on earth. Um, he frames it in that way. L Luther does a really good job. You know, it's interesting. Luther does a very good job about talking about parenting and parents. Um, and in this, which is, uh, it's a postal from, uh, on the marriage estate. It's a sermon that Luther wrote in 1519. By the way, he doesn't have any children in 1519. He's not married in 1519. In fact, 1519 Luther would probably be uh, too Roman Catholic for most Lutherans. Um, but he says, parents perform no more damaging bit of work than to neglect their offspring, to let them 
curse, swear, learn indecent words and songs, permit them to, to live as they please. They are constantly concerned to provide sufficiency for body rather than soul. Therefore, it is highly necessary that every married person regard the soul of his child with greater care and concern than the flesh which has come from him, that he consider the children... Uh, the child nothing less than a precious eternal treasure entrusted to his protection by God so that the devil, the world, the flesh do not steal and destroy it. For the children will be required for the parent on judgment day in a strict reckoning. And so the understanding is children, and this is the biblical framework for it, children belong to parents, right? I think you've heard me say this before. Many times, yeah. I have my own children here, so I can I can say this thing. But they, you know, children belong to uh, to parents. Not, and and you know, somebody would say in an objection, "Well, that's property," as if children are property. And and um, I mean, in some sense, the way the Bible frames things, children are the property of their parents, and there's really nothing wrong with that. It's not an understanding of abuse, you know. Um, as if something that I've been given, I'll just go and throw it in the trash. Uh, but it's an idea of a trust that's built, right? And they're belonging, they're in that uh, trust until another family is made. That's the biblical understanding. And we see that Paul talks about it, Ephesians 5 and 6, all about marriage relationships and parents and children. And then in Genesis chapter 2, right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become um, one flesh. So you note in those passages, there's nothing about age or ability, which would be very contrary to, to society now. Most of the time we would say, well, children are, when they become a certain age, when they become 18, then, um, well, then they're emancipated. They can go and do whatever they want, right? Or they're out of my house, they're out of my responsibility. And, and you know, now I think that the, the age has gotten even later, right? Sometimes it's 21, sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 30, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 26. I mean, because, and, and what society bases that off of is brain development, right? Uh, a, a person's brain is not fully developed until about 25 or 26. So you think the decisions they make are not fully informed decisions, right? That's fine. And we can take that into account. But the way the biblical framework is for children is they belong to that family until they are given in marriage to another family. Families beget families. That's how it works. Um, because you think the Bible doesn't frame everything in the sense of an individual. It frames everything in the sense of family. That's how God creates the first things you know, and he orders everything sort of, if you think about it as an umbrella of things, the closest umbrella to people is family. And then I would say the next one would be church. And the next one would be um, government or the civil estate or whatever the case may be, whatever we, we live in. There's question about what we live in now, but whatever. So um, the responsibility then rests on parents and um the Lord makes this very clear, and I, I chose Genesis 18 here. This is after the, the visitors come and visit uh, Abraham and Sarah, you know, and um, the Lord says, uh, he doesn't say to Abraham, he says to these angelic visitors that come, the Lord said, I shall hide from, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And we're found in faith in him. But he says, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So even in the understanding of salvation, God is uh, calling uh, parents and uh, to catechize, to instruct, to command their children to carry on that faith. Um, and that theme gets continued uh, all the way throughout the, the Old and into the New Testament as well. Luther writes in the large catechism, he says, 
Instead, they, that is parents, should keep in mind that they owe obedience to God and that above all, they should earnestly and faithfully discharge the duties of their office. Sounds like they're taking an oath to the civil government, not only to provide for the material support of their children, but especially to bring them up to the praise and honor of God. Therefore, do not imagine that the parental office is a matter of your pleasure or whim. It is a strict commandment and injunction of God who holds you accountable for it. Um, and that uh, that's law, right? That's, that's a command for you to do something. I mean, it condemns, if you think about it, um, the Lord is going to hold you account for who you are as a parent and how you were as a parent. And the understanding here then is the responsibility is given in the gift of children to parents first. So when you say accountable, yep. according to the law, I know that pastors and teachers and all those are quote, held accountable yep. at a higher standard with parents be considered as such? I, I'm under the understanding that when James talks about in James chapter 3, te not everyone should teach because teachers are held to a higher regard. I mean, he is, you know, talking about the uh, pastoral office or teaching in the church because you don't want to teach false things, but uh, parents are held to that standard as well. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that. That's even how the small catechism frames things. It is in the household. It is the parents teaching their children. Um, and we do this. We've talked about this before. Often what we do sometimes in confirmation and sometimes in the church, what we do is we, um, people like to, and this falls right into, they like to pass off responsibility for things to someone else. So I'll say, you know, um, my children, they didn't become Christian. I blame the church for that. And sometimes there is blame that falls upon the church, right? Depending on what the church is preaching. And um, this is why pastors are held accountable for the souls by which they've been given, right? Which should be absolutely terrifying for someone in the pastoral office. It's And it's good. It should keep you in track for what you're doing, right? But um, the, the responsibility for children always in the biblical command is for parents first and you know you can't um you can't pass responsibility you can delegate authority but you can never delegate responsibility up to someone else so god gives the state and the church for the means of assisting parents in raising their children we have that pastor teaches the children in confirmation or in catechism or whatever the case may be you know, and of course, in the service, everyone gets taught. Um, and the state comes in, at least in our own context, the state comes in and says, well, I, we have teachers and we have public education. And that's for the raising of, you know, I would argue, good, godly citizens within the country that we live in. Um, but at least for the education of those uh, young people so that they can become good citizens. <laughs> So, um, you know, teachers, we talk about teachers in the school, they act in the stead of parents, uh, first and foremost. And, and again, I mean, it's important to, I mean, and this creates a burden, it can create a burden for people, but it's good to frame reality in that because what happens is, you know, who has the most influence, you know, in your child's life in certain years, it is at the school, you know, um, you think about who spends the most time with them throughout the day, not sleeping, it is a teacher. And um, it's not to condemn that, but it is to say, you know, parents have to take an active role in, in what their children are being taught, for one, most especially, and who is teaching them. And there should be a standard for that. And I would argue, and this maybe goes back to Christian nationalism a little bit, I would argue that in the context that we live in, the community, the community and those parents come together to dictate what the teacher and the, it, the educational institution does, not somebody who is far removed from that, who says, well, let me tell you what your kids need to know. Well, you don't have that responsibility. I do. So, um, which is, I mean, very contrary to our own education system, unfortunately, right now. Um, um, 
it might be better in a smaller town perhaps but um, so Christ gives this example as well, and he gives it to the apostles. We can see that Jesus said to them, and this is probably should be very familiar, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, that is the Christ. And then he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He holds responsibility. He is the one who converts but then he works through means, he passes, he gives that, delegates that authority unto his apostles and to his church to go forth and, and do those things. Um, and that's our framework of how people come into the faith, right? You don't become a Christian because you've made a decision to become a Christian. You become a Christian because God has, by the Holy Spirit, chosen you, changed you from dead to alive in Christ Jesus. Um, so he's working through means to do so, but he's the one who's the ultimate authority for those things. And and I would argue, too, parents, and we talked about this when we talked about the state and everything like that. Where do parents get their authority from? They get it from God. So they act in that stead of God when they do the things that they're doing for their children. And so, um, you know, I actually had a conversation with someone who wants to be a police officer. And that, and having been in law enforcement myself in my previous profession, that's a good way of framing how you do actions and understand things in authority as well. I get my authority, if you're a police officer, from God. He gives this to me to act for the peace and the punishment of the wicked. And so that should frame how I do things in my vocation, in my calling, and keep it focused upon not myself. I'm not coming of my own authority to, you know, maybe abuse that. And I've seen plenty of abuses of it. But that, you know, what I do, people, whether they know it or not, will have some kind of view of authority and ultimately God's authority from that. Same thing with parents. Um, and we'll talk about that. Parenting is always done uh, from the bottom up in perspective of things. Um but authority is coming from the top down. So a practical meaning for with saying all that, you know, and and uh, putting that on on parents is the command for for parenting is never done in perfection. By the way, everything doesn't have to be done perfectly, but it should be done. And so a good way of of framing the way we think about things, a salutary way, is looking at doing the right thing and saying, I don't have to do everything perfectly or in some kind of state of perfection. So if you think about your life as a Christian, your life as a Christian parent, it's based on, everything is sort of based on our own justification, that God has done everything for us and he's made us holy and perfect and blameless in Jesus Christ. So if my standing before God is uh, completely and utterly perfect because of what Jesus has done, then I don't need to do things perfectly and obsess over how I didn't do them perfectly. Um, but I can do them more or less imperfectly with an intention um, to, to this or that detail gradually improving over time. And, and if you want to, I'll frame that in a Christian sense for you, if you're a parent or even grandparents are held to this too, that, you know, you don't need Pastor Cullen to bust up into your house at 730 at night and be like, well, this is the perfect family devotion that you guys are doing, and you guys have it all right. Because your standing is not secured upon my or someone else's sense of whether I'm doing something perfectly. I'm doing it because it's a good thing to do, and I'm called to do it. So the idea is an encouragement is key. So, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, Kim and I went through this when we talked about parenting and we talked about even doing devotions and putting things together. There's always this idea that I want to compare myself to what other people are doing. So some people are doing nothing, right? And what I'll do is I'll look at that and say, well, at least I'm doing something I'm better than them. <laughs> and that's not good. But I'll look at some people who maybe do a whole lot. I mean, we at one point we were at a church in central Missouri. The pastor there, a good godly man, I mean, he did a lot with his family. You're not teaching your family Greek and Hebrew every night, you know what I mean? And all this Latin and things. And you're not doing a full service, you know, almost in, in evening prayer. And and um, so then you think to yourself, well, I won't do anything because I can't do all the, these things. Or when I try to do something, depending on the age of children, you know, sometimes it might not work out perfectly. 
and that's okay. The point is you do things because they're good to be done. They're good for your children. Um, and that, you know, even in, in the epistles, when the apostles write to other congregations, you notice they don't say, and these are in the letters that we receive in the New Testament, they, they don't say, well, you're praying, that's great, church in Corinth, but you're not doing it right. You're terrible at this, you know. No, they, they encourage them to do the right things. And, you know, you build upon those things as you go through it. Um, I, I think we have the same framework for things like sports. I don't know. We don't take that understanding with sports as we do with, with church and devotion and even gathering your family around as a Christian. I mean, <clears throat> you're not, you don't, there's no expectation that you're just going to go out and be perfectly good at whatever sport you're trying to play. You have to practice. Depends who you're talking to, right? And there's some there's some humility in that too, but still have you have to practice, you know, you have to go at it, you have to continue to do it. The same thing's true for uh Christian parenting. And um the key here is doing those things because you want your children to be the takeaway is Christian, first and foremost, before anything else. So if we're gonna frame our life in this world as God's people, it should be framed in vocation, living in the Christian life. And, and the wonderful thing, and we'll talk about what vocation is, but the wonderful thing about vocation is it really simplifies things for us. It eliminates confusion about our true purpose in this life as a Christian. And the, and the word vocation there, it comes from the Latin word vocatio, and it just means calling, right? If something is your calling, then that means God has called you to do it. Uh, it means God told you to do it. Um, and he speaks to us in his word. So pa parenting, to be a parent, is a calling from God because it's explicit in his word about that. And you know you're a parent uh, because you've been given children, right? So... Um, so if God told you to do X, then it follows he ordained and instituted specific work for X as an example. And there are lots of vocations, not just parenting, pastor is a vocation, your job, your as a work, uh, someone who works in society is a vocation, father, mother, husband, wife, children, that's a vocation, student could be one too. Um, those things that you're doing, um, and uh, even the vocation of ruling or government, like we talked about for the past couple of weeks, God has instituted that. That's a calling uh, for order and peace. So we think about vocation. Vocation is really wrapped up in uh, the third use of the law. And if we we'll remember, the law of God has three uses. The first one is to curb sin. That's a moral understanding. God gives us the Ten Commandments. He tells us how to live, and he puts that out, written into the hearts of people in society, even though they suppress it. We could see that in curbing sin with civil laws, too. Excuse me. Uh, the second use of the law, it acts as a mirror. It shows you your sin and your need for a Savior. That's the old SOS from Confirmation. Um, and then the third use, right? Third use of the law means God's given me his law, his commands, He's told me these things because he wants to guide my life. Um, it teaches that God has created work for us to do. Um, and uh, there's a clear direction of those things. You know, it's not necessarily a checklist or a step-by-step. -step. There's no checklist in scripture that says, you know, here, here's how you be a good parent. There are lots of clear directions, um, but not necessarily a step-by-step. -step. So it, it teaches us what the Christian life looks like uh, by teaching us what he has instituted us, you know, this life for. Um, and, and culture has a really warped view of that. So the world we live in, especially regard to parenting, rejects this guide that the law puts across, how things are designed to be. And you see that in how people and what gets promoted in society, um, life priorities, you know, um, identity, we could talk about sexuality and gender, marriage, citizenship, all those things. Um, the world, which in and of itself is sinful, promotes an idea of something that is contrary to God. It'll say, well, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, did God really say? And then it'll tell you something different. Um 
And, you know, all of these things, this guide for life isn't burdensome. I mean, it, it can become burdensome because we're sinners and we do these things uh, imperfect. Um, but we should keep this mindset that God has actually instituted these things to give us perspective. So he's not saying, well, you know, you be the perfect parent, go out and do those things, and I'm going to accuse you. Well, there's no accusation against you that's not laid upon Jesus Christ. But it does give you the understanding that what the world wants you to do um, and the priorities that the world gives to us should always be measured and tested against the word of God to see if they are true, right? Paul says this. We talk about this a lot in Romans chapter 12, Allison's confirmation verse, right? Uh, I think verse two is. But I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So your life you lead, uh, that everything you do in this life is we could consider worship to God, not just coming here on Sunday. But do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the model, the model for family in Christ in voc vocation is chiefly found in dying to yourself. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in marriage, right, the husband dies to self to serve his bride. Paul says this in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, right? In parenting, both mother and father, dad and mom, die to themselves to serve their children. And Paul talks about this in Ephesians 6, a little bit, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Or, again, Proverbs 1, Proverbs are all about this wisdom. A father imparts wisdom to his son in order to go into the world. It says, hear, my son, your father's instructions, forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head, penance for your neck. They hang over you and follow you all the time. Um, and even there's a, a dying to self in later in life for adult children. They die to themselves to serve their parents who raised them. Right? There's a this is the blessing, part of the blessing that's found in the fourth commandment. If you think about in the fourth commandment, it's the commandment with the promise, right? We've heard that before. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land and your uh, that the Lord God is giving you. It's long in the land because you have children. You demonstrate that you cared for your parents and they care for you in your old age. Um, and Paul talks about this to Tim Timothy. If anyone uh, does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So the key here, the key point in life is not what's worth living for. It's not It's not producing selfishness, but the key is really what's worth dying for. It's a sacrificial life. I'm willing to die to myself for my children. I'm willing to die to myself for my wife. I'm willing to die to myself for the love of my neighbor. Um, and uh, sacrifices are the key for that. So if we want to get some key points in the vocation of a parent, number one, it's that there's a glorification. Uh, living a life that glorifies God always. Paul says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink. So when you eat like a, a maniac at dinner, then uh, are you giving glory to God? There's a parent to you. <laughs> Parent, and the point of that is, though, <clears throat> parenting has a primarily upward direction, right? If I'm doing these things, they should be pointing to and reflecting God and his glory. And so children are informed by example, uh, which is not only uh, God's pattern, but it's his gift as well. 
modeling godly roles and life for children. And this conflicts with the world because if you're not going to model it as a parent, somebody else will model it for you. And so uh, who is modeling those things in, in a child's life, right? Media, social media, movies, music, school, all those things should be considered. Um, and again, parents are the authority on, on, on the model, not a perfect model. And actually that's a good thing. You don't, I mean, a perfect model, a model of perfection has no forgiveness in it. And so a, per, a parenting model has forgiveness. For, I mean, parents should be forgiving their children. Children should be forgiving their parents because the realization is they're all forgiven in Jesus Christ. So, um, so yeah, we just said that something that isn't taught at home, then it's learned somewhere else. Um, protection is an element of that as well in, in a vocation of parent. Christian parents have a strong desire to safeguard their children from both physical and spiritual harm. And I think we do well with the with the physical harm most often in society. We don't want somebody to physically, in fact, we probably have become more <clears throat> aware of physical harm in life now than maybe we were uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, case in point, I mean, we watched as a family, to, uh, was it last Saturday, ET, and my wife and I were like, commenting that the kids had such a freedom that they're riding their bikes in the woods and like they're all over the place. The mother doesn't really know what's going on. And I don't know if that would happen nowadays. I mean, I don't think it could. if you live, well, you're on land, I guess. Probably... Yeah. Maybe if you had your own land, I guess. I mean, but oh, you're Dover. you know, I think about um, our own children here, even in Sullivan, which is a very safe place. And that's the point of living here that um you know parents still don't do that i mean i i i've got to give a, my my child a phone so that they can call me if they need it or i can track where they're at well you know 30 40 years ago that wasn't you just yeah. go out and then when it gets dark come in okay. you know Jeremy right Jeremy right um so Solomon says, and again this is in Proverbs, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. So parental care involves giving your children length of days and years of life. And the book of Proverbs really showcases that parental roles and responsibilities to provide protection for children, protection that's physical, moral, social, financial, emotional, all those things, you know. Jesus says in the context of what he's talking about, he's talking about bringing kids into the church too, but see that you don't despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always, uh, always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Um, and so uh, protecting them from a great many things. I, I think, like I said, we do a good job physically often, but sometimes spiritually um, that becomes a little less. What am I exposing my children to? Who is competing in my house with my own voice and my own instruction, right? Because there is a moving image that is in every home, probably, that competes with that, you know, or on the computer screen or whatever the case may be. Um, and there's an understanding in, in parenting and the vocation of parenting of active dis uh, discipleship, right? In other words, Scripture doesn't ignore life or faith, and parents are not called to be passive with children. So culture would say, let your children decide whatever the thing may be. What was actually very popular maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago in, in our country would be, let your children decide what their faith or religion would be, you know, and I'll let them decide. And that doesn't work. And, and really, it just builds kind of an apathy. Now, what that evolved into is let your children decide their own identity or their own gender or their own sexuality or their own aspects in life. That's egalitarianism. That's saying we're equals and I have no command or responsibility to raise, to teach you, you know, aside from making sure that you're just not dead 
and that you've actually get fed. Um, but all these other things that identify who you are, especially your faith, I'll just leave that up to whatever. You decide what's best. Um, and that's crazy. I mean, that is, yeah, it, it destroys. And you can see the kind of the fruit of that that happens in our own society. Scripture teaches very differently too, right? You think about, um, this is Deuteronomy 6, 7. It, it, you shall teach them diligently, your children, and you shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. There's no point in which you're not teaching and talking to your children in the home. Um, and that means about a great many things. Strong foundation if you don't show them what that foundation looks like. You know, if they're constantly, I mean, I, I think about building a house. How can you build a house if you never, ever look at a point? by which to do so and never picked up a hammer yeah. to nail it. I mean, it, it's, it's the same concept. <clears throat> Your children are a house. I, I, I would say in the modern world, all of that is built upon the understanding that children are burdens. If it, I mean, I we live in a culture that pumps it into your head that children are a burden. And, and some of that comes through things like, uh, you know, mid 20th century, the advent of birth control and abortion and some other things that, you know, children are, are not always a blessing. They're a burden to you. And, and then that means teaching them and being diligent with them is, is a burdensome thing as well. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, um, or sometimes it becomes a dependency upon another institution that God has never designed dependency to be upon. Right. I don't need to teach my kids anything. I'll take them to school. I don't need to teach my kids anything about the faith. I bring them to church. That's pastor's job. I mean, it is pastor's job, but the response, I mean, I think we've talked about this before in Bible studies too, and maybe in sermons as well, that, you know, if, if you compart, and this was back to Christian nationalism, if you compartmentalize your faith, if I come to church and I just say, that's my church time, and then I'm going to go out, and then those are like two different worlds, there's a hypocrisy there, and and children are very much aware of that. Um, and you see the fruit of that, I mean, in in, um, in churches now as well. So uh, Paul says this again, too. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Catechism, catechesis, is more than just head stuff. It's not like downloading a bunch of information and then you're good to go. Um, because you hear that even in confirmation students, I hear that as a pastor, well, they knew all the questions, they knew all the answers to the exam, they knew all the tests, and then, well, they're never in church ever again. But, you know, catechesis is something that's lived out in a public life. It's it's a way of life, um, not so much something that's just head knowledge. Because what happens if it's just head knowledge, I'll fill my head up with a bunch of knowledge. I'm good to go. I've checked that block and I'll move on to something else. And that's that's not how scripture frames your life as a Christian. It's not how scripture frames parents and children or any of those things. It's formational. Everything is formed. So you're formed in vocation. It's holistic. It's body and soul. It's incarnate, just like our Lord Jesus Christ, just like his word. It's coming to us physically and in spirit, right? That's what corporeal means, physical and sacramental. I mean, that's how the Lord's Supper comes to us. That's how baptism is. That's how Jesus is. It's incarnational. And so parenting and teaching and your life as a Christian is incarnational. I learn these things. They drive my heart to do these things. And I, I demonstrate that to my children who need to be taught and raised in that. Um, and again, when you fail, forgiveness is there, and that's the teaching point as well. Just in our house, because like when you say that, um, my sister and I talk about like how we read our Bible study and then we go about our day, <laughs> everything, you know, we go back and go, oh, we didn't even miss, like we didn't live that out. Like, yeah. You know, say if I, a tattoo person, but if I did, I want to like, I think my old pastor used to say, if you put crosses on your glasses and just wore them constantly, be constantly reminded. Yeah. How you're supposed to act, but that's what I think is so hard is to, you know, you do your devotion, you say, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. And an hour later, you're like, 
Well, and I think I think the good point of that is um, is it, it's a constant reminder of those things. Um, it's a constant reminder to be in God's Word, and that um, that we are very quick. I mean, you're right. We're all, we are very quick to forget those things that happen uh, that we read and we hear that God is doing. But you know, um, those are things that. Uh, in the word of God and in prayer, the spirit is, I mean, the word's living and active. It's doing something in you. And uh, the, the purpose of your Christian life and even in catechesis is really holy habits that develop those things to keep me in that, to keep me constantly reminded of it. I mean, that would be the point of having crosses in the glasses because you're constantly seeing those things before your eyes. And so um, doing those things and framing your life in that way um, and it does mean it does start devotion, scripture reading, church on Sunday, um, but uh, you know also constant reminders of those things as well. I mean, a Christian household should have things that remind you that you're Christian all the time, you know. And I, I, I I'll give you examples. I'm not saying that these are thus saith the Lord or something like that. But every house, every room in our house has a cross, has a crucifix, and again. I mean, it's a reminder that those that what God has done for me and who I am, who I belong to. Um, the same thing in physical things, making the sign of the cross, even carrying things. I mean, some people uh, can carry crosses with them or things like that. I mean, why do you think I dress the way I dress? It's not because it's comfortable. I think I've said it before. It's not because it's comfortable. In fact, it's really off-putting for a lot of people. But I mean, part of that is a reminder of who, of what, uh, you're I'm called to do um so teaching teaching a bit with it since we're doing modeling so mm -hmm. you know you know I have a his phone and I have a my you know my eight o'clock wake up to seek him first so then you do your devotion but it's really not about that I think like just the fact that we're teaching our children to seek him first. yeah you might you might be out grocery shopping and someone really makes you mad and your mind should say seek him first. Yeah. You know, so what should I be doing right now? So it's not really just what it's everything you're doing. You know, everything you're doing should just, you know, when you have a problem, you should seek him first. When you have, you know, okay, ask him or so it's really the concept, which I believe, like I don't know what the church does here, but like we were raised seventh and eighth grade confirmation, you know, every Saturday morning and me and I always like at seventh eighth grade how do i know but i was just talking to my dad about how you're rooted in that then yeah you know so then you do come back to it you know like yeah. now as you get a little older when it, you know maybe then it wasn't what you thought you know but as you get older oh okay okay now i know why i was about all these things you know so it's really seeking him all the time you know? yeah learning learning telling your kids to have conversations and seek him Seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added to you, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, no, I would I would agree. I think that's the holistic approach. And and even knowing that you're failing at that and seeking forgiveness and confession. So, you know, modeling that confession, that repentance for children is really important as well. Because we don't want to get to the perception of, you know, my uh, i i portray a perfection to my children and they say well i'll never be able to make that standard because i fail because it's a false perfection it's not a real thing right 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 yeah we have to say to our kids like yeah we're sinners yeah that's why we have to keep calling on it you know yeah i i think um so it is. I used to have a, I, when I first joined the army, I had a, a platoon sergeant who would never drink or eat in front of us because he goes, I didn't want to show you weakness. You know what I mean? And I thought, and I thought that was, I don't know, when you're young, you're like, that's cool, you know? But then I think about it stupid too, because, you know, here's someone who's supposed to model how you do things and lead you, but he's not even showing you when it's time to take a break or time to yeah, take right. care of, of the needs that you have so you can continue on. So, I mean, the same thing's true in, in parenting um, as well, um, for sure. We serve an omnipresent God. And if you call yourself by his name, you are always in his presence. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But not an excuse not to go to church. <laughs> I hear that often. 
Um, so parents act as God for their children. Um, and God does this in a lot of occasions. Pastor to people in the command and by the stead of my Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it happens in the divine service. People, God's people act to that for unbelievers. Let me tell you about the Lord and what he has done and that there is forgiveness in him and parents to children. And you get the best, the, the best example of that is with God to Moses and Moses to Aaron. And this is after the burning bush in Exodus chapter four, when uh, God is telling Moses, go to Egypt, tell my people and tell Pharaoh to let them go. And Moses says, I'm not going to be good at that. And so he says, therefore, go, I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he, Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, uh, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you, and he sees uh, he sees you. He will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his words and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. In other words, he's acting in the stead of that. God is using means to do that. The same thing's true in parenting. So if you're a Christian and you want your children to have at least the same investment in Christ and in the Bible as they do with a lot of other things you pass on to them, sports and politics and education and stuff like that, you have to provide them with ways to do it, um, which means you have to actually talk, like we just said, about the Bible, even risk of telling your children something that you don't know. I don't know the answer to something, and that's okay. Um, and this is what it's getting in Deuteronomy 6, right? These are the words that I command you today, it shall be on your heart. Teach your children diligently. And in fact, right before that, right before that, the Lord says to, to, uh, to his people in regards to teaching in Deuteronomy 6, he says, I'm the Lord your God who called you out of Egypt. So in other words, he's telling them, I've, I'm the one who gives you the promise. Now go and teach your children diligently about that as well. And so the, the key point here for the role of parent assumes, Scripture assumes, and the Lord really expects that parents teach their children at home, both in word and deed. And like I said, the catechism frames it this way as well, right? Basic teachings for Scripture, for the Bible, the, the essentials to Christian life is what we would say is in the small catechism. It's taught by the head of the household. The head of the house of the family should teach in a simple way to his household. Um, and Luther, Luther does the same thing. He does in the large catechism, he teaches pastors to help parents in their catechism and to teach in a very simple and concise way in the home, right? But with the young keep uh, to a single fixed and permanent form and wording to teach them first all the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and et cetera, according to the text, word for word, so they can repeat it after you and commit it to memory. Memory is important. M memory is important. It goes back to what you said. I mean, you know, memorizing things really does make a difference. And, and that's because when you're often in a point of distress, like I'm tempted with something, I'm in temptation or I'm in maybe emotional or some kind of stress that comes upon me, you don't have a chance to either say, well, let me look up something real quick or, you know, let me think clearly. And so memory, we've talked about this before, memory builds uh, the, the spiritual sort of muscle memory of how to pull those things up. If it's in my mind and it's locked in there, then when something happens, that'll be the first thing I recall. God has designed your brain to be that way. He's given you that. And so we should capitalize upon that, especially in children. Children have the great capacity to memorize an enormous amount of things very quickly, more so than adults. Um, and for those things to stay with them, with, with the understanding that they're practiced. I think I had a conversation to, uh, this week with somebody about your faith and catechesis and the way that you go. I mean, if you learned a language... If you didn't practice that language all the time, it would slowly dissipate from you. You know, if you took four years of Spanish in high school and you 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 never 
touched anything to do with Spanish in 10 years, then you would say, hey, speak some Spanish to me. And you're like, hola, that's probably what y'all are, doing, <laughs> you know? Um, and the same thing's th true with, with what the Lord is teaching you in his word, right? So the, the vision for parenting, first and foremost, is making disciples. It's, it's, uh, it's coming into a godly life. And it doesn't mean that religious beliefs are inherited. They are in a sense that a child makes them their own. Um, and uh, things do run in a family. The Old Testament's really good about saying that when they invoke this understanding of the God of our fathers. Uh, but if we let kids decide about their own religion for themselves, uh, when they get older, older, generally what it means is they'll share in their parents' indifference to it. That's all they're passing on to them. So transmitting the faith is part of the vocation of, of parent. And uh, and we'll leave off with uh, just a few practical things. It starts with baptism. Bringing your kids to the baptismal font where Christ makes them his own, and then bringing them to church and having the word of God at home and in the church, constantly in their ears, feeding them, instructing them, um, and this is, I mean, not only your life, but life as a Christian. I would want for my children, first and foremost, to be Christian, to inherit eternal life, then for them to be successful in some kind of job, to be very good at playing some kind of sport, to have some kind of fame or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and again, those are very different than worldly priorities, which say, well, don't you want to be famous? Don't you want to be really successful or make a lot of money? Yeah, that's great. But First and foremost, I want them to be Christian, and I should, you know, structure myself in that way as if these things actually matter, because they do. All right. Any questions, comments? You said children are a blessing. Yeah. Um, and, and that God gives people, when you talk about adoption, and yeah. predominantly, I am going to talk about same-sex marriage adoption. Sure. What's your take? I mean, talk about children being a blessing i know god can bless even the wicked yeah i understand that I get yeah that. but i guess maybe I, i'm just a little bit yeah I, so i would say if you talk about same-sex adoption the, the problem is i mean in the framework that god is blessing families is in the framework of husband and wife male and female um and so you're right can can god bless you know society uh, a, a disordered family, uh, even a child by being born or being adopted by a same-sex couple. Yeah, I mean, blessings fall. Uh, the Lord does all sorts of things with great wicked stuff. But the, the understanding that the framework that scripture has, it, it doesn't even assume. It's not saying, you know, well, two men come together and they adopt and that's the blessing. If you look at how it frames things, it's the opening and closing of the womb and it frames both mother and father in those things as well. So it always assumes male and female because that's the properly ordered relationship that God has ordained. When you have a deviation from that, same-sex couples, right? Then, or you even have, let's say maybe, and this is sometimes common, a woman uh, gives birth, but there's no father involved. Then then you have a, you have a, uh, a disorder in how God has designed things, and there will be temporal, real-life sort of ramifications for that. Um, and again, it doesn't mean the Lord can't make something good out of that, but uh, the the blessing of promotion for uh, children should be man and woman, husband and wife. Yeah. No, it's a good question, though, because it does come up quite often. Um. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the blessing of children, for opening and closing wombs, for giving your gifts to your people, namely your holy word and your word made flesh in our Lord Jesus Christ. But keep us always in that, that we may see ourselves first and foremost as you, as yours, that we may do those things that you call us to do, but we may see ourselves forgiven in our Lord Jesus Christ, both as parents and husband and wife and children and in all vocations. In Jesus' name, amen.